Hello everybody. Good day. Good day to you. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to another Road Reflections. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Trying to trying to get out here, get out on the road. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh got a got a, uh, a fun little topic for you guys today, but before we do that, I just want to jump in. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, obviously, if you want to find out everything that I'm doing, that's all available right on my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. And you can find uh, the donation sites, donation options there. You can become a sustaining member, check out my uh, albums, check out past episodes of Road Reflections, Forkful of Noodles, Taboo Table Talk, any interviews I've done, any podcasts I've popped up on, uh, my regular appearances with uh, Ron Placone on Get Your News On with Ron, those are available on the old Webby site as well. So that's the one stop shop for all things Chris Mohan. Again, it's K R I S H M O H A N H A H A dot com. That's the place you want to go and check things out for me. It looks like I gotta, I gotta take a little detour here is, uh, is, is, is what I'm, is what I'm kind of noticing you guys. Uh, but that's fine. The detour is not too far away. Uh, the off ramp is literally right in front of me. So, um, kind of, kind of didn't need to preamble that for, disregard the last three seconds, I guess. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention up at the top, too, is uh, my friend Eleanor Goldfield, uh, who is a fantastic spoken word artist and a musician and activist and organizer and podcast host, has released a new EP, her first solo EP called No Solo. Uh, and she explains why it's called No Solo, even though it's her, quote, solo project, right? Um, it It's awesome. I, I've got to hear I got to hear uh, a couple of those tracks at the live shows when uh, we were, when you know we were doing tours and stuff and and she would kick off the show with Lee. I've had to follow Eleanor after she does these like really incredible performances uh, and it's I as a comedian following like really ama- like intense and, and passionate uh, spoken word uh, artists and musicians can be tricky. <laughs> uh, and it definitely was, but it was always an honor to share the stage with her because she's such an, uh, she's so awesome. And it's, it's, I think you guys are really going to like the album. Uh, so I highly endorse it. Go to artkillingapathy.com. That's artkillingapathy.com. Get yourself a copy of the album. You're gonna dig it. You're gonna love it. It's gonna it's it's gonna blow your fucking brain out of your head. Probably, maybe. It's, it's a possibility of that, but it's all, all all kidding aside. It is it is a um, really 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 great album here uh, that that I think everybody should uh, everybody should check out. Well, I gotta I gotta make sure I'm heading in the right direction here. <laughs> Because everything's loopy looped around. Um, getting out of getting out of downtown sometimes is more cumbersome and obnoxious than uh, than you might think. Uh, so I gotta go and do this a different way, I believe. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine. I always hate. I always hate this coming through downtown Pittsburgh because it's like if you take the wrong turn you've just added about 48 minutes to your trip for uh, pretty much no reason there's absolutely no reason for that much time to have been added to your trip but here you are uh, with the, with an extra 45 minutes because you made a wrong left turn accidentally so trying to basically not uh, do that again um so yeah uh try to pay attention to some of those you know detour signs and uh and think of the best way to get on get on get in en route to where i need to go uh i don't know why i'm giving you guys like my directions 
<laughs> it seems kind of unnecessary, but oh well, whatever. Um, I do have a pretty good story that uh, I think it's an important story. Um, it's 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 a CNN article I read about you know gas shortages. Uh, and, and kind of did some extra little digging to see what's what's going on with it and how 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 corporate media is covering it uh, and uh, and and what they're trying to say through their little little avenues of propaganda here uh, is is sort of the way that I'm you know I'm kind of running through the article here or, or rather that's how I read it I read it as like there's some there's some nice pieces of propaganda in there. Uh, so the article essentially talks about this gas shortage that's coming up, right? Because it's about to be the summertime, and, and they talk about this in the article. It's about to be the summertime, and everybody's going to go on vacation and travel around because, you know, we've, some people are, are vaccinated, they're more comfortable. And again, my statement on the vaccine is do what feels comfortable for you. I'm not here to push the vaccines one way or the other. It's just an objective fact that people are getting vaccinated and uh, and will be, you know, going around the country to do whatever it is that they want to do. Now, this means flying. This means driving. Um, I think a lot of people are, are, are driving uh, to places. Um, so that's why the gas shortage thing has come up. I know a couple of my friends are doing that. Look, excuse me. Uh, they're they're just driving around, you know, seeing seeing different places around the country because because they can, and they're, you know, uh, either camping out, um, or they're uh, or they're staying in hotels or you know with family and so on and so forth. So I've seen I've seen some people do this. Uh, so that's not really the shocking part of anything, right? But uh, what CNN goes on to say is the reason why. There aren't. Uh, there's going to be a gas shortage. Isn't because, you know, that you, that that we're oh man, oil is a finite resource. Fossil fuels are, are not great for, uh, you know, for the planet and for humanity and for our existence. No, it's because truck drivers. They, they don't have enough truck drivers to um, get the gas to as many places as they need to as quickly as they need to. Right. So once again, uh, we're we're looking at blaming the working class, blaming blaming the 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 people. Right. Oh, you know, maybe more people should have been truck drivers. Why aren't they? Why aren't they taking these jobs? Perhaps it doesn't pay well, and and maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I'm I'm not uh, up to speed on the um, on the salary of truck drivers and 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 such, but. Um, Maybe they're not being paid enough. Maybe they don't have good benefits. Maybe the the the, the hours don't really uh, match to the to 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 their purpose, to what they feel is you know the right thing to do. So uh, part of the problem is that a lot of truck drivers last year took the cue and retired. Go figure! Holy shit! They actually retired actually did the thing that they were going to do, right? So, basically what happened is, when everything shut down, they were just, and the article literally says this, they were like, hey, we were just having them ship, like, boxes and stuff, just so they could do something. Which, again, is like, isn't that, isn't that sort of the, 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 the tenet of capitalism, which is, it, it's just like, yeah, there's nothing to do, and we can still pay you to keep you on on staff while you're not doing anything, but uh, but go ahead and do something so we feel like you know we're being valued for our money. But if you look at it in in, in um, comparison to the uh, insurance companies, where a lot of people pay into health insurance in order to make sure that they don't wind up with astronomical hospital bills, and what happens? They have to go to the hospital and they end up getting the bills anyway. So it's like you're not doing any. These insurance companies aren't really doing anything but they're making money hand over fist and then when it comes time to actually do what they're supposed to do uh oh it turns out that you don't have the right insurance plan you're going to be saddled with a bunch of medical debt on top of still having to pay insurance uh so you know 
the insurance companies get away with not doing anything and making money. But when it comes to the working class and there's a global pandemic at play and, you know, they can't be truck drivers or be whatever job it is that they want to do, oh, you have to do something in order to earn an income. It's not like there's a, a global medical catastrophe that's happening in front of our eyes and corporations that have been raking billions before the pandemic can can lose a little bit to make sure that their employees that have given years, years of their life to, to that labor should get something out of it anyway, right? So these truck drivers retire. They retire. Uh, and on top of this, so I think that I think it's it ended up being like 70% of the workforce was turned over in 2020. Excuse me, I keep yawning. Um, uh, but on top of that, an additional like 40 to 60,000 truckers were dropped and let go by the company that cur that th these companies that have a shortage of truck drivers and they're not and they're kind of letting them go for this like really dumb fucking reason too it's because uh, either they failed a drug test which i get but still uh or 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 uh they have had a drug or alcohol problem in the past now uh if these are truck drivers that have been truck drivers for a very long time um, I've met a handful of truck drivers uh, on the road and they've kind of told me about, you know, the, the difficulties of doing their job, how strenuous it is, how stressful it can be, you know, the um, uh, deadlines they have to meet and such. Uh, so you want them to do this really dangerous job. You want them to do this high pressure job. You want them to be able to drive through the night get to the next truck stop, sleep for a few hours, wake up, eat some breakfast, get back on the road, drive another 18 hours to ensure that the, whatever product that they're hauling is going to be delivered to the appropriate location in record time so that everybody can make a profit. And if they don't, then, you know, it's somehow their fault. But, you know, so they have to do this nigh impossible job, but you don't want them to take any sort of stimulant drug to stay awake, to make sure that they're alert and being safe on the road. What kind of fucking hypocrisy is that, right? Like, not only that, but you're ru you're running out of truckers, and you're like, hey, what's what? How can we make this harder? As a truck rolls right, <laughs> that was a construction truck, which, by the way, is where uh, a lot of these. Uh, drivers are going to, right? The the ones that retire either end up getting some, some kind of construction job or the ones that uh, were truckers and were like, hey, I'm not waiting around for the industry because y'all ain't fucking paying us anyway. We'll just go do construction jobs. And he, I'm sure even the, the addicts, right? Like, I mean, I mean, really think about it. Like, you, you want these people to stay awake. Um, so they do. And how do they have to do it? Like, okay, sometimes coffee's not going to cut it, so they end up taking Adderall, or they end up taking some kind of some kind of narcotic that's going to keep them awake. That's going to mean that they're going to be able to drive longer hours, longer distances, in order to make sure that this fucking trucking company gets its products to whatever delivery company at the right amount of time to make sure everybody's maximizing on profits. So the drugs are actually helping the corporations, and yet they demonize them anyway. And on top of that, they, they might deal with a shit ton of pain, right? Some of these truckers are awake for long hours, of, long periods of time, sitting and driving, and that can, that can do a lot of havoc on your back. I know through personal experience, I, I don't, I didn't, when I was touring, I definitely didn't drive as much as a truck driver did. I've, I've made my fair share of 12 to 16 hour hauls across the country to do shows. But, you know, I wasn't doing, like, truck driver level of, um, uh, of driving. And even then, uh, you know, I fucked up my hip, my lower back, my, my thigh, like, you know, all seized up. Like, if I don't, if I'm not physically active, like, I'm, I'm finally being able to start working out again and I feel a lot better, you know, but 
it, when I wasn't, it's like my back would cramp up real quick and, and or my feet would cramp up real quick. And you go through these problems. Like, so what do you do? You know, the, the, only, the only thing you, you can do in that circumstance, which some people might take heroin for that as a, as a pain reliever. Like that's what morphine is for. It's just, it's just you know, we, we legalize it when, it when it's convenient, but we make it illegal when it, when it is not. So for these truckers, like that might be the thing. And you know, I'm not anti-drug. I, I think, you know, I did a whole video talking about how addiction is a response to trauma. And, and I agree with Gabor Mate as far as like why people get addicted to drugs and such. And they might be going through some trauma, physical or mental. Maybe maybe the truck driving industry has gotten to them. The long hours, not being able to be with family, that, that could have been something that negatively impacted them. And again, you, you create this uh, cycle where the only relief these folks would get, you're criminalizing. So... It's very backwards, right? That's kind of what the problem is. Beyond that, there's not enough people going through uh, the CDL certification, the commercial driver's license certifications. They're not able to take the test and 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 do all that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a um, uh, not enough of an influx of new drivers coming in. And part of that seems like part of that was because. Uh, they shut down the schools during the pandemic and when they reopened it's you know nobody was really the, or not nobody but a lot less people were applying to it so you know it kind of became a little bit of a of a problem but perhaps people would have been a little bit more enthusiastic to come back to the workforce and come back to looking into truck driving jobs and so on and so forth uh, had there been some incentive to do it had there been some financial way that they could have funded this right I'm, I'm sure the schools aren't cheap I'm sure the schools are not free um, in fact I, I remember meeting somebody uh, this is one of the earliest tours I did I, I took a, a, a bus to do some shows up in the uh, Minneapolis region this is um, almost eight, nine years ago now. And I met this guy on the bus uh, who was going to be a truck driver and he was like, yeah, I just, you know, sold some stuff and paid for the school and now I'm gonna get go and get trained and get certified and drive a truck. That's what I'm gonna do. He was like, eventually the money will balance itself out. But, you know, so, but if we put a UBI in place so that these, these truck drivers who, um, have given up their you know have put their bodies on the line for the company and 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 their and their mental and physical health uh, as well and these folks would have finally had something in their pockets the rest of America would have had something in their pockets and they could go you know what I feel like I want to be a truck driver more people might have been encouraged and they'll say hey I have this uh, this passive income coming in and I can maybe turn that into active income something along those lines Perhaps, right? I'm not saying that's a guarantee, but perhaps that would have helped. I, know, I mean, a UBI would have definitely helped. And what, what's kind of ironic about this whole situation is like, when Andrew Yang, who is not, uh, <laughs> who's not any, uh, a favorite of the left at this point, um, you know, I did follow his campaign and I did, I did like a lot of the stuff he was saying um, and, and thought that, you know, him introducing UBI to mainstream talking points was was something that was kind of great but like more and more he has shown his true colors to just kind of be this neoliberal capitalist anyway he kind of he kind of uh, made himself out to look like he was this um outsider and you know by talking about how we need ubi and all that kind of stuff but the way that he kind of sold it was truck drivers you know, these guys are, uh, they're, they're automating vehicles, they're automating truckers, like what are you gonna do with these folks? That's a large percent of the, the workforce that's gonna be out of a job. We should probably 
look into a UBI to help these folks out. And that UBI can go into uh, training programs for other, you know, other vocations, things of that sort. So in principle, his idea is, you know, kind of works, but... The way he was going to do it was was trying to tax corporations, which I, I do think corporations should pay their fair share. Uh, the only problem with that is this this plan would fall short considering corporations still control legislation. Like, they use lobbyists and lawyers to fucking control legislation. So even if this happened and corporations had to pay, you know, let's go back to the Eisenhower days where they would have to pay 90% corporate tax... And that was going to be one of the ways that they were going to fund a UBI. It would still put the power in corporations' hands. And it would still ensure that corporations would purchase politicians, as they do, to write and pass legislation that would give them more loopholes. And, and uh, you know, eventually the UBI system would fail. Be, and, and it would have it would have been designed that way. The, the corporations would have purposely made it fail. That's one of the problems I see with Andrew Yang's plan for a UBI. Um, but you know, truckers were at the central point of his UBI argument. So. I feel like we should have done that from the get-go, and and again, it's it's just short-sighted. Like, had there been had there been some kind of financial assistance given to the American populace by the United States government, we wouldn't be seeing half the problems we're seeing now. You know, people wouldn't be on the uh, verge of evictions. People would not be like. I mean, I think people would. The reason why UBI was not taken in place is, is because I think it would have given people like the American populace a little bit more time to learn value for themselves. To say, great, I'm getting $1,000 a month, and it seems to be getting me by. It's not enough, but it seems to be getting me by. Um, you know... If I go back to the workforce for 25 hours a week at 10 bucks an hour, that's barely enough for me to feed my family. And I think we would have run into the same problem where then it would have been like, okay, well, now minimum wage has to meet basic needs. Uh, and, it, and, it, and you know, we tried this temporary UBI thing and it basically showed us that uh, even when we do this UBI for a thousand bucks a month, in a lot of cases, people aren't being helped. People aren't getting their basic needs covered. So that's part of the reason why they didn't is because it would make the it would it would force them to increase the minimum wage to uh, a livable wage, not just a quote minimum wage, right? There's a lot of industries that are about to take a hit because of this quote gas shortage, right? That because these because they don't have enough truck drivers to deliver the gas. They're talking about vacation industries, right? Hotels, airlines are going to be hit. Uh, gig economy workers. I mean, if gas is too expensive and you need your car to do the to do the gig economy stuff, then you're then what are you going to do? At the end of the day, you're 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 showing up in the red, right? You're 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 in a, a negative balance. If you made a hundred dollars in a shift, but you had to fill up the tank, and the tank is now sixty dollars, you cleared forty, but then, you know, some of that money is going to have to go to rent and food and all that kind of stuff and maybe you don't have enough at the end of the day and then what and then the cycle starts all over and what if you have a bad week and you don't even make a hundred dollars so gig economy workers are going get, to get get hit by this a lot harder and again it's not really the fault of these truck drivers who have valued themselves and said we need more or looked at it and said well I don't know when this industry is going to come back. So I'm 63 years old and I'm going to retire. 
you can't fault them for doing that. This article is trying to, but you really can't. Basically, any industry that uh, you don't need to work from home is going to be affected by this. Service industry people. Because again, now, now the gas is too expensive and, you know, things are going to reopen back up and America's vaccinated so we can all get back to doing all the things we love to go back to, quote, normal. Uh, whatever the fuck that means. You know. You're not going to be able to, to support your your local business if you can't drive to it. And a, and a lot of cities are, are built specifically for driving. So it, it, it's benefited the uh, fossil fuel and the oil and gas industry. You know, that's really all it really is, is, is doing. Like, there's not a lot of walkable fucking cities around. Now, all it's really, all this, this big problem has shown is how short-sighted um, and foolish capitalism really is. Because it is. It is short-sighted and foolish. You know, there were, there were uh, uh, various different types of fuel options that were suggested. But, I mean, we had the, we had the uh, capability of making an electric car in the 70s. I mean, had they, had they actually explored that instead of killing it because oil and gas was going to be such a, you know, we're going to be such bitches about it. So they, they killed the, the notion of an electric car. Now we see some electric cars, but hell, that technology has existed forever. Had we explored some uh, viable options, we might not be in this mess. Right? And I'm not saying the electric car is the solution to everything. The electric car still has its fair share of problems because, you know, you, 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 we might have replaced... I'm sitting next to a gas station right now, you know, so we might have replaced two out of the six pumps with um, charging stations. But how is that charging station going to operate, right? A lot of these are still coal-powered. They're gas-powered. Uh, so fossil fuels still would have won out in the end. But the public perception of, hey, if we can do this, then why are we driving around gas guzzlers? It seems like the electric cars are more efficient. They're better, you know, for the somewhat better for the environment. And then we could have switched over to uh, solar powered cars that have a battery system, right? Like you, you, you let it soak in, or 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 rather than that, maybe the batteries themselves are what you let soak in the sun. Or you create like a UV, like you have like a UV light that they can, uh, you know, store energy through. And you basically replace the batteries. Now that's going to need lithium and, and that still creates an, uh, a natural resource problem. But these are still alternatives that if we were in this, like we wouldn't be in this mess if we had various different options. And to make these cars affordable, right? Because the problem with a lot of these cars right now is that if you're not driving a gas guzzle, which I understand the irony of talking about this subject in a vehicle as I'm driving, um, the, the problem is, like, they can be expensive. Not everybody can afford a fucking electric car or a solar-powered vehicle. It might just be priced out. So, again, you kind of see, like, money is a limiter in this situation. There were options that you could have taken uh, taken into account, so that we had. Uh, I mean, I I think we should be very much moving away from the consumption of fossil fuels. But you know, isn't capitalism all about competition? Isn't capitalism all about variety and choices? Isn't that what the, what they always say? But where's our choice in in uh, uh, in terms of energy and fuel? There is none. It's got to be fossil fuels. It's hard to find a fucking electric charging station. In a city like Pittsburgh, I think there's like one or two. There's not a lot. So even even in the incremental steps, we're being incremental in our incrementalism when it comes to this problem, which is just asinine. Like I said, they had the fucking technology for electric cars decades ago. Think of how think of how much. 
that technology could have improved and advanced had we stuck with it. Now, the second issue comes for, uh, for the gas, uh, gas hikes, especially on the East, East Coast, comes from the Colonial Pipeline. Um, I don't know a ton of information about this yet. Uh, I know Robbie Yeager has done a lot of work on the Colonial Pipeline. And I have, uh, I've got to check his work out, but there are only so many hours in the day and I am but one man. Uh, so, you know, take, take that for what you will. I, I will, I will eventually cover all of the stuff with, um, the Colonial Pipeline and I would love to have Robbie on my podcast. That's something that I am working on. Uh, but again, I, I, I kind of do all the things uh, for all of the channels and podcasts that I run. So sometimes it takes me a little while to, to, to take care of stuff because then I'm just overloaded by all the shit that I got to do. Uh, but apparently the Colonial Pipeline uh, faced a cyber attack which has affected their invoicing system more than anything, right? Like it hasn't affected the pipeline from guzzling gas uh, as it does, it's affected their invoicing system. And and the, here's the irony of it all, right? The cyber attack seems to be ransomware. They're, they basically hacked this thing and said, hey, pay us this much money, and then we'll let go of your, your servers and such. Uh, so the Colonial Pipeline seems to be held ransom. Uh, but, you know, they're saying that there's a gas shortage now because of this as well, or like the gas shortage is being exasperated because of this as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, they're going to hold the East Coast ransom because they're not going to give gas until their invoicing stuff is cleared out. When realistically, they could probably take the hit and say, okay, our invoicing is down, but we're still going to take a hit and make sure that there's energy for the East Coast, make sure there's gas for the East Coast. But they don't. But they're not going to. Because they want that money. They want the regular gold with that black gold. Now the claim is that the shortage is going to depend on how, uh, how long the pipeline is going to be shut down. Uh, so if it's shut down for a long time like a couple weeks, then yeah, you're going to see some gas hikes. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Uh, but if it's not, if it's shut down for like, you know, a couple days, we're going to be fine. Again, this is all about the invoicing and has nothing to do with the amount of natural resource that they are pumping out of the ground and shoving through these pipelines. And USA Today, who, who wrote this article basically said, you know, this is why critical protection of critical infrastructure is necessary. It's why the protection of in critical infrastructure like pipelines specifically is uh, is key and we can't we can't let anybody, you know, attack our our glorious pipelines in this country and they, and they keep re, re, re validating that these are critical pieces of infrastructure. When when in reality they're not they're poisoning the land. Uh, they're poisoning the air. Um, and, uh, and, and they are basically, basically the USA Today and any sort of neoliberal or neoconservative outlet is going to champion the, the use of fossil fuels, uh, because that's how they make their money. So they're basically cashing in on the destruction of the planet. Um, and what part of, part of the problem with, with stuff like this is like, they are demonizing any sort of protests of these pipelines. Right? We've talked about Line 3 on this channel quite a bit, um, and they're demonizing that sort of stuff by saying, look, look, when, when, when interruptions like this happen, when, when there are protesters or cyber attacks or whatever, you know, oh man, look, the oil gets disrupted, the gas gets disrupted, you don't get to do all your fun things to shame these protesters. So this is on top of the fact that there are already laws in place that um, criminalized protests as it is. I've talked about that several times on this channel. Uh, ALEC has these boilerplate laws that a lot of states have taken in where it's a fine and number of years in prison, and they can add additional things to that as well. But they're just boilerplate pieces of legislation written by a Coke-funded um, you know, corporation, essentially. 
And now USA Today is basically justifying the demonization of protesters by saying, oh, look, these critical infrastructures need to be protected, not protested. Like, So they're, they're just protecting the destruction of the planet. And then it goes on to say, well, Russia could have been behind it. Russia. You guys, Russia. It's Ru fucking Russia. And you go, oh, my God. Russia's behind it? How do you know? Cause, because Russia... Do we need more? I have a picture of Rachel Maddow holding up a picture of Stalin and saying the word no. Do you get it? They're like, yeah, but what's the proof? Because Russia! That's the whole thing. The article doesn't say anything. It just says Russia might have interfered. And then the article goes on to say, well, Russia is a safe haven for these kind of people, right? It's a safe haven for these kind of uh, crooks and criminals. It's a safe haven for them. Whilst ignoring the fact that U.S. banks launder money for gun runners and drug cartels. Chase, Wells Fargo, plus U.S. banks have funded and laundered money for Nazis. Actual fucking Nazis. Prescott Bush helped the Nazis funnel and launder money through the New York State Bank. I covered that in, in the show I did about the Fed. Okay? Not just that, but Rockefeller was selling American Standard Oil to the Nazis. American Standard Oil to the Nazis. These are, these are all people connected to the American banks. So, remind me again, who is a safe haven for criminals? Because it kind of seems like America is a safe haven for criminals. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough, America is also a safe haven for war criminals, corporate hucksters, coup creators, assassinators, and straight-up murderers. They're all protected by the United States. The CIA is is involved in, in creating coups. Assass FBI has assassinated people. All protected by the United States. So remind me again. How Russia is a safe haven for criminals. But America isn't. And that's your justification. That's your defense. That's your proof. That Russia was involved in this cyber attack. But, the, I mean, but neoliberals will fucking fall for this shit. They'll fucking fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. Because, because the Cold War never ended. And, and most of these fucking, like, staunch Democrats are so roped into the McCarthyism that if they hear the word Russia, they're like, Oh, evil things are happening! Our oil! We gotta protect the oil! Protect the oil, you guys! Fucking uh, fuck climate change. Russia's happening. I want Russian change. I want change in how Russia is operating. It's just validation for xenophobic hate for no fucking reason. Look, gas prices always go up in the summertime. I every every time I would tour around this time of the year, the gas prices start going up. More people have to travel. More, more people are going to travel, right? They have vacation plans or they just go out on drives or bike rides or what have you. That means that they're driving around more. That means they have to fill up more. So they jack up the prices so that they can, they can over profit on everything. And then they bring the prices back down to, to not, I don't even think it's a reasonable amount. In the wintertime, there's like an encouragement for people to go out and start driving and use more fossil fuels and such. They go up every year, right? So so the, the gas prices are not attached to this vague idea of shortages. They're very much connected to capitalism. Now there is a reason why the gas prices might go up. And they're trying to convince people that, oh man, this is such a crazy thing to happen. 
well, it's a crazy thing to happen because you kind of manufactured it. You got rid of your drivers. You didn't provide anybody with a UBI to go to school to become new truck drivers. The elderly and truck drivers are, are, are out of the industry. And you're stirring up the fucking pot. All to justify raising gas prices. Because I think most people have figured out that it's all bullshit. So let's see what happens this summer, right? I mean, you know, this whole notion of like, we won't sacrifice the economy for the public health or whatever the fuck Biden wants to do, which is basically the same shit that Trump wanted to do. Open the economy, open up schools, get the businesses back going 100%. I'll put a mask mandate, but not really. I'll just say, hey, fucking do it, or else I'll squint at you a lot more. And I'll smell your hair. Virtually no different than what Trump wanted to do. I bet you still people will fucking do it. People will still go on their road trips and vacations, and they'll just swallow the gas prices. But, you know, who, who is to blame for this? Short-sighted capitalists. That's really who's to blame for this. The crisis that's coming is manufactured by short-sighted capitalists. It's not because of the working class. It's not because of Russia. Short-sighted capitalists create their own problems and then blame everybody else for it. All right, I think that's uh, that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe. I'll be doing a couple more of these uh, over the next few days. Live streams coming back May 17th, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific time, and all of the time zones in between. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is what I'm going to aim for, so three live streams a week. Uh, definitely on Rockfin um, next to start I'll be on YouTube and then I'll, I'll be phasing out YouTube and Facebook I'll be primarily going on Odyssey Rockfin and uh, um, Periscope and for whatever reason if Odyssey doesn't work out I'll, I'll bring uh, either Facebook or YouTube back for a short you know for, for a short period of time or what have you because I have to look into the way Odyssey wants to do live streams I, I read an email and I still don't fully understand it yet but uh, I'll, I'll probably get clarification if I read it a little bit closer um, so that's what that's that's coming up that's next week so and I got a I got a pretty fun yeah, fun uh, <laughs> fun ish show planned for you guys uh, on on the on that day so uh, with all that said and done, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. For all things Krish Mohan, my albums, if you want to make a donation, if you want to become a sustaining member, um, uh, check out past episodes of the show and, uh, and, and a bunch of, other, bunch of other shits on that website too. So again, that's krishmohanhaha.com, it's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. You guys have been all, uh, very lovely. Uh, you guys always are very lovely. And uh, I will see you guys again very, very soon. See you on the road. Bye, guys.